it's kind of like very in fashion right now to say that it's over and it sucks and I'm not a part of this. I mean, I look around last night and it's like people as far as I can see. <laughs> like, I don't know, I don't think this is going anywhere. So you're kind of the, the grizzled veteran of the industry, and where do you see the industry going right now from your perspective? You know, people are like, oh, the bubble, it's over. No, it's bigger than it's ever been, and it's reaching farther than it's ever gone. I think it used to be just like, here's dance music, and it was one group of people doing it, and it's not like that anymore. It just continues to get more and more diverse, which to me is, is good. It shouldn't be all one flavor. I would say that uh, being a touring musician or DJ is not the life for everyone. It's extremely difficult. Hey, and that's a really bad ball. But that's, you know, so how many dates family. are you on the road every year? Typically somewhere between 200 and 250. So I mean the majority of the year, it's like about three quarters of the year I'm on the road. Um, but that's changed a lot. I mean one of the reasons I was really happy to see Las Vegas kind of work because it was much easier for me to go from San Francisco or LA, wherever I was living at the time when it started to click, to, to Las Vegas, as opposed to going to Ibiza. Ibiza is like almost two days of travel. It's about 24 hours of travel to get there. So when Las Vegas worked, for me, it was a huge relief. Like, wow, I can have something, a residency here that's so close to home and have it be where I set up my home base. So, I mean, that made a huge difference for me and my family. It was a big, it just changed everything, changed our life. And did that factor in, because you were the first person to sign a residency yeah, in Vegas was. as a DJ. Yeah. And it was a huge factor. I feel like you're one of the most engaged DJs with your fans. I mean, you're always tweeting at them, you're always responding to them. Are those Redux shows just for them? I mean, it's obviously not to bolster the bottom line by any means. I mean, yeah, they don't make any money. Actually, last night I paid, I paid Insomniac to play that show. Really? Yeah. Not that, 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 not that that's anything and the fans won't understand that. They didn't have a sound system at that stage. Yeah. And that's where I wanted to do it. And they said, if you want to do it here, you're going to have to pay to put the sound system in. I'm not sure that Pasquale knew that, but it was just like, okay, cool. Here's where the opportunity is. It, you know, it's a few thousand dollars to put a sound system there. I want to do this. This is what I'm going to do. And redo, it's funny because redo now, I'm not even sure what it exactly means. It's yeah. something that I made up. I always like when people are like, that wasn't a redo set. And I'm like, what do you mean, man? I don't even know what that means. And I'm the one who made it up and I'm not even sure what yeah. it means. I mean, I know what the spirit, the spirit of what that was is to, just to be able to play atypical records. You know, stuff that's out of the norm. And I think, I started it kind of at the height of EDM because I was like, oh, no, I can't play these records on a festival stage, but I right. can play them in a small club to 500 people. The whole scalping thing, it becomes such a hot ticket, and the yeah. idea was to price the tickets back to what club tickets were supposed yeah. to be. You confronted a scalper, right? Yeah, I confronted a scalper on camera, which was very uncomfortable. Is he texting you right now? Yep. And I wasn't trying to out the guy, and actually when I did it, I kind of felt a little bit bad. Yeah. You know, I was like, man, listen, I'm not trying to like beat you up or anything, but why are you selling this ticket for four times the price that you bought it for? <laughs> hey, it was obvious when he saw that it was me, he felt so bad. That yeah. He's like, why are you buying the ticket? And I'm like, dude, you're selling the ticket for $150. I sold it to you for $20. Why? You he, knew, he knew it was you though, right? No, it took him a minute. Okay. Like, he was like, is this you? You don't scout redo tickets, dude. Let's talk about the uh, the Forbes list a little bit. Yeah. Something that you said ruffles little feathers in, in, in your industry. I think it does. Yeah. Yeah, sure. People don't like lists much <laughs> in the world of art. How, how do you react when you see something like that? I thought it was fun. It was something yeah. different. Money, for whatever reason, makes something legitimate. Yeah. And so many people don't give this world any credit the music or the scene in general. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's like, wait, Calvin Harris is making $66 million? It's like, <laughs> it's kind of hard to ignore. Right. You know? All of a sudden it's like people kind of paid attention. So it goes from just being EDM to actually just music. I to mean, industry, yeah. yeah. Like, wow, this guy's a musician. He's writing and producing music. People in the pop world, when we go out and we tour and 
and I'm and I'm moving all these tickets. Live Nation to this day still can't understand. Like, wait, what are you doing? I mean, this is a touring company for them. I, I, they were more shocked than I was when the tour sold out in minutes. They're like, how is this possible? What are you guys doing? Are our numbers accurate? On my side, they're always quite a bit under. Okay. Which. I don't mind that, that's fine. Okay. That's cool. Okay. That's, that's, I've always been the sneak attack guy anyway. <laughs>